hello to all the viewers. Welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Nice to see you again. Yes, you too. I you see you're back in your, your checkers. You're smart today. Yes. Uh, do you also look very smart today again? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. How was your week? It was hectic. I can't stand this lockdown anymore. It's too busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we, we are busy. Um, let's get right into it. Let's open up with a word of prayer. I'll pray. Again. You'll pray? Excellent. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for bringing us together again. We ask that the blessing be upon this discussion and we also ask that you bless the viewers and that the Holy Spirit will enlighten us with everything. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. What have we got today? Well, I thought maybe we can talk a little about the pillars of Adventism. Seeing that we've already discussed in previous episodes uh, the spirit of prophecy and the Sabbath. But there's other, other pillars also that the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands upon. And there's a lot of opposition and misinformation about Seventh-day Adventists. And there's also ex-Seventh-day Adventists that make videos against Seventh-day Adventism. <laughs> and maybe you can just elaborate a little bit for us on what these people say, why do they have some truth in what they say? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a major thing. Uh, there are, as you say, web pages which, <laughs> which try to uh, discredit what Adventism stands for. And it always boils down to the same basic things. And uh, I, I do not doubt the sincerity of these people and they feel they must enlighten the world, but uh, they have serious misconceptions. Now, one of the big things, of course, is uh, the sanctuary, uh, the disappointment of 1844, the investigative judgment, and the perceived perfectionism when it comes to the law. And then, of course, they love to quote Ellen G. White on these issues and say, now, look here, this is what she says. Mm. And it is very easy to do that, by the way. And the issue of perfectionism is a, is a major. And the issue of perfectionism has been a major throughout history. Mm. And we should not forget that. Uh, if the devil can use his tool to drive people into a self-sustaining religion, he will do that. Yes. Our religion is based on Christ. And our salvation is based on Christ. And as soon as we bring in an element of self in our salvation, then we get into trouble. Mm. But there's no doubt that Christ requires obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who says he loves me and keeps not my commandments is a liar and the truth, truth is, is not, not in him. him. I have not come to abolish the law. And then he says not one jot or one tittle will by any means depart from the law, disappear from the law. Nothing, not one jot or one tittle. So all of these verses tell us that obedience is a prerequisite. Now, am I saved through my obedience? No. But am I saved without obedience? No. No. So how do we get the right balance? And uh, I'm always stunned when I, when I see how these people quote Ellen G. White yes. and what they talk about and all of these issues. Let's just have a look at what the pillars of Adventism are that sets this denomination apart from all others. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a good exercise. I think that was a good starting point. Okay. So I, I have a slide here and it says, after the great disappointment, uh, we can stop right there already. Yes. We're in trouble already, right? Yes. The Great Disappointment of 1844. 
Now, what had happened is they had studied. Now, not the Adventists, they didn't exist. No. Let's make this quite plain. Adventism evolved out of a great awakening movement. And there were two streams in this awakening. It was, a, it was virtually a universal awakening, but particularly in the United States, there was what was called the Great Awakening. And the one stream was the evangelical stream, which believed in the temporal millennium of peace, where all the nations would be converted, and many were on board waiting for this millennium of peace on the earth. And then there was the other stream, which was uh, basically from the Millerite movement, from William Miller, who studied the scripture and came to the conclusion, like many, many previous researchers had found, that this was not scriptural. Mm. And that there wouldn't be a temporal millennium of peace where the nations would be converted. It's almost like a second chance doctrine, right? Mm. And the scriptures clearly taught something else. The scripture taught that Christ would come with power and great glory, and that Jesus would come to the earth, and that the wicked would be destroyed at that coming. Mm. And there are numerous verses in the Bible which deal with that. Perhaps you can post uh, one of the links on the Bible verses in sequence as to what happens. Um, it's called History's Coming Climax. Yes, I'll post that. Post that one. And then the resurrection of the righteous, the translation of the living righteous, and together they meet the Lord in the air. They are taken away. So this concept as opposed to a concept of a secret rapture and then a millennium of peace here on earth where everybody will be converted, etc., etc. These two issues were in conflict. Now, it was based on the study of Daniel, the 2300 day prophecy. Mm -hmm. And it has a specific starting date, 457 BC, when the decree went out that Jerusalem was to be restored. We're not going to do the Bible study. And when you work it out, it works out to 1844, when that time period ends. Yes. They made a mistake in their calculation, <coughs> because it went from 457 BC to AD. They miscalculated in terms of the zero, mm. because you cannot count the zero. So, it actually was not 1843, yeah, but that 1844. Was the, 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 the initial date was 1843. Correct, because they'd made a calculation error. Yeah. And then, of course, Christ didn't come. And they didn't understand the wording of Daniel. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. cleansed. And this started a whole investigation. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 10, let's just go there. Revelation chapter 10. There's a chapter there about this mighty angel who comes down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face were as it were the face of the sun. It's a description of Jesus standing on the water and on the land. Mm. And then he has in his hand a scroll, but it is sealed, it is closed. And a sealed scroll is, is something that, has, that people have no knowledge about. They don't know what it means, but it was to be unsealed, it was to be understood. Now, if you study your Bible, you will find that there's only one prophecy that was sealed. Daniel tried to understand what the prophecy meant, but he was told by the angel Gabriel yes. that it is sealed for the time of the end. end yeah. So only then will it be understood. Go your way, you will rest, and 
in the end you will stand and receive your allotted inheritance. So here was a sealed prophecy and the time had now come for the unsealing of the prophecy. Yes. And then this beautiful story in, Dan, in Revelation chapter 10 where John in vision takes the scroll and eats it. In other words, internalizes the message and it was sweet as honey in his mouth. Yes. In other words, it was a joyful message. And the joyful message of the unsealing of the scroll was, Christ is coming, coming again. Now. But then it turned bitter, sour in his stomach. And there was a great disappointment. They thought the end had come, but the end had not come. And then they received the instruction, you must prophesy again. And uh, this we read in Revelation chapter 10. And it says, and I, let's read from verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter, bitter disappointment. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again. It's a very important word. Yes. They thought prophesying, preaching had come to an end. Mm. But they were told no. Now you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. In other words, there is a universal message that yes. you now have to bring to the world. Now what is that universal message? Where do we find similar language? We find it in Revelation chapter 14, where we have the three angels' message. And we read there from verse 6 in Revelation chapter 14, and it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Unchanged. In other words, the same gospel that has existed forever. There is no gospel of dispensation where uh, <laughs> the criteria for salvation change mm. over time. Yes. So there is no dispensation of law when you have to be obedient and grace where you do not have to follow the commandments. So I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel, and we've said it many times. Adam and Eve were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. They had to slaughter the Lamb, and their nakedness was covetousness by the skins, in other words, the righteousness, the righteous robe of Christ. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every, and there you have it, nation and kindred and tongue and people. So here follows the message, and it's the three angels' messages. Now, people say that they had a wrong interpretation of the Bible. And this great disappointment points to the fact that actually their start was a laughing stock. Yes. It didn't come. A false teaching didn't come to fruition. Now the question is, of course, uh, has God made use of disappointments in the past? And what was the purpose of the disappointment? Well, just go to the crucifixion. Jesus had taught on numerous occasions exactly what was going to happen to him. Mm. But because of their concept, and their understanding of this kingdom that would be introduced where the enemies would be dissipated, it went over their head, right? Yes. And so what happened was when Jesus then was crucified, their hopes were crucified with him. Yes. And here they were incredibly disappointed. disappointed. Correct. And we read about those two who were walking on the way to Emmaus. Yes. And the third one appears amongst their midst. And they're so dejected. Have you not heard what has happened? And all their hopes and dreams are gone. And then Jesus started from the beginning and gave them a Bible study. And when they finally grasped it and they knew he was, they said, did, did not our hearts burn within us? Mm. And they had so much energy <laughs> that they ran all the way back to Jerusalem. 
tell the disciples, and they of course all believed them, right? <laughs> no, they didn't no. believe them. So this is a situation. Mm. Now why did God allow this great disappointment? Well, it purified the church. Because only those who were convinced that they had not been misled, that there must be something else, yes. were still part of the movement. So the loaves and the fishes uh, adherents were gone. Oh well, another false prophecy, right? He was going to be the one, but now he's dead. And so there was a great disappointment then, and at the end, again, there was a great disappointment. Now who was disappointed? The people that were involved were from various denominations. It was Methodist, largely Methodists and Baptists. Mm. Largely Methodists and Baptists, minorities on, on the continent. Mm. And then there were Congregationalists and there were, of all the other denominations, each one of them with separate entities of truth. One little group believed, let's say, in the state of the dead, that the dead sleep until the resurrection. Another group believed another doctrine and eventually they studied the scriptures and said what does it mean the sanctuary will be cleansed they thought it was christ was going to return to this earth and the earth is the sanctuary and the and the sanctuary was going to be cleansed from this thing called sin yes. but that's not what it meant no. and then one day a man by the name of Edson, Hiram Edson, Hiram Edson was walking in his field. Uh, that was after the Great Disappointment. Correct. They were, they were studying the scripture to see where they had made a mistake. And then suddenly he understood in a, in a, in a form of a vision almost that the sanctuary was the sanctuary in heaven and that it had to be cleansed. And so the great sanctuary doctrine uh, developed. Now, the sanctuary doctrine is unique to Seventh-day Adventists. Um, just uh, something that I'd like to mention also is, at that part, Ellen White didn't have any visions yet. No. And she didn't predict the coming of Jesus in 1844. No. So there's just a misconception on that also from the Millerite people. preachers from all these different denominations, there were about 112 of them, they were the ones that through Bible study had come to these conclusions. Adventism evolved out of this great disappointment. So the sanctuary doctrine is basically unique to Seventh-day Adventists. Now here's, a, here's an interesting question. If you study the Old Testament, how much of the Old Testament concerns the sanctuary? The whole Old Testament. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah, everything. The sanctuary is everywhere. Everything. All the services, the whole, the whole Pentateuch, the five books of the Bible are about the sanctuary. Leviticus is about the sanctuary. I mean, the sanctuary forms a huge part of the yeah. Old Testament. It's about the sacrifices and all the... Everything. everything that is associated with it. And the New Testament is just gone. Now, is there perhaps a major truth in the sanctuary doctrine? And the answer is obviously, yes, must be. If it forms such a great part of the Old Testament, then surely the sanctuary must be important. And uh, when you get to the book of Hebrews, you will understand how Paul uses the typology in the Old Testament and makes it applicable to the New Testament. And it's a beautiful study. The book of Hebrews is a fantastic book. Let me just go to the book of Hebrews. And you know what? Chapter 9 is particularly important when it comes to the book of Hebrews regarding the ministry of Jesus Christ. Yes. Now it says, Then verily, 
the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So here was a sanctuary on earth. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So on the, in the earthly sanctuary, there was a first chamber, mm -hmm. And separating the outer court from the first chamber, you had a veil. Then you had this first chamber in which were the candlesticks and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. And then there was another veil. And Paul says that this veil represents his, Jesus' flesh. That was torn on our behalf and that's why the veil tore or when Christ was crucified. So there was the first apartment. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Mm. Now, this is very fascinating because when we deal with the sanctuary doctrine, Adventism gets a lot of flack. Yes. And we need to understand why this is so important. The sanctuary, of course, stands for the plan of salvation. salvation yes. Now, we've, we've dealt with it in the past, but let's just briefly go through it again. If you take the tabernacle that Moses built, which was a pattern, mm. and the temple was later just on a larger scale, yes. but it had the same meaning. And everything is so precise. It's mm. so beautiful. There are so many messages hidden in it, within the size of all of these things. So when you come from outside, from the world, and you come into the sanctuary, you came through one opening, one door. Jesus says, I am the door. Mm. Immediately you were surrounded by the outer wall, which consisted of white linen. Yes. That represents the righteousness, righteousness of Christ. So when you come to Christ and you enter into the door, which is Christ, you are surrounded by his righteousness. And then you had to bring a lamb if you were a sinner. And we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then you had to sacrifice that little lamb. And the blood was applied to the horns of the altar. And the sacrifice was burnt on the altar outside. That represents the cross mm -hmm. where Jesus died on behalf of my sins. Now the, high, the priest that officiated... He also represents Christ. Jesus Christ. So, in type, the priest also had to bring a sacrifice for himself on a regular basis. And because he had taken a small portion of that lamb, when it had been roasted in the fire, he would put it in his mouth and he would eat it. So, in type... The sins that had been transferred and confessed over the lamb, the lamb had died for the sins. In type, that sin was transferred to the high priest. In other words, in type, he became a type of the sin bearer representing Jesus, Jesus. Christ. Then when he brought his own sacrifice, then in type, that sacrifice not only was a sacrifice for the, the high priest, who was a human being's mm. sin, but also for those that had been confessed. And then he would take that blood and he would carry it into the holy place and apply it to the horns of the altar. Now in, in type, that blood was shed for my sins. Mm. So it is the record of sins. Yes. So in other words, all confessed sins are carried to the holy place and placed on the horns of the altar. Can we put that in modern language? Yes, please. All right. It's not a very good analogy, but let's use it as an analogy. Let's say that uh, there's a computer and... Uh, all the sins that have been confessed are on the drive and then you transfer them to the big server which is inside the sanctuary 
and there is a complete record of all the confessed sins. So the record of confessed sins is on the main server, which is the horns of the altar in the holy place. And then the next thing was the laver, mm. which represented the washing of rebirth. And then when you went into the veil, you went again through Christ, you come into the veil, you're covered by the righteousness of Christ. There's the candlestick, there's the showbread, there's the altar of incense. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So the candlestick represents Jesus, the light of the world. There are seven mm. candlesticks. The number seven is, of course, the number of divinity. We can go into great yeah. details. There are seven churches, seven. Christ the Savior of all ages, etc. The altar of incense is the intercession. Christ, my intercessor, who pleads on my behalf. And the smoke that goes up, Revelation tells us, is the prayer of the saints made acceptable to God through the merits of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful story. The showbread represents, there were 12 of them, represents Christ. The unleavened bread, the bread that came down from heaven, his character, his life that was shed for me. And I have to internalize that bread. In other words, the bread of life. So the candlestick, yeah. the word, the bread of life, the character of Christ must be internalized and I must accept him as my mediator. Then the record of sin had to be at some stage once a year be removed from the sanctuary in type. Mm. So you went the high priest once a year into the most holy place. And in the most holy place there was the law inside of the uh, in the ark, the ark of the covenant now the law is the standard of judgment the law actually condemns me to death the law cannot save me only the spotless lamb of god can save me and above the law there was a mercy seat mm. it's a beautiful name it's actually a throne yes between two cherubim yes and there God himself sits on his throne, on the mercy seat. In other words, God shields me through his mercy from the condemnation of the law. It's a beautiful picture. Now, there were two goats at that stage that were used in this sacrifice. Mm. There was the Lord's goat and there was the scapegoat. Yes. And what they did is the high priest went in and he made atonement and he sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice up against the ark mm. and he made atonement for the ark then he went out into the holy he made atonement for that then he came out mm -hmm. and he placed his hands upon the scapegoat and in type transferred the record of confessed sins to the scapegoat mm. who was led into the wilderness and didn't die that's what happened. Now how do we apply that? So Adventism realized, or the early Adventists, when they studied this, that there must have been an event that took place in heaven. Yes. Where Jesus, as the high priest, officiating, went into the most holy, and the process of the cleansing of the record of sin took place mm -hmm. in the Most Holy. And here is a bone of contention. Now, you, know, you have to go actually to Daniel chapter 7 yes. to see where this all starts. So let's go to the book of Daniel. And let's go to the book of Daniel chapter 7. And we can read there from verse 9 and it says I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool 
His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set and the books were opened. Now this is a scene that takes place in heaven. Yes. Here is a heavenly judgment scene. Now what's going to happen? Now remember, Daniel chapter 7 deals with the kingdoms of the earth and in particular with the little horn power that the reformers all identified with the Roman system, yes. the Roman Catholic system. So here's a judgment scene. But it's not on earth, it's in heaven. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So the system down here, the Roman system, the papal system, yes. was speaking great words. And I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So he watches the final stages of Earth's history. We are now in those stages. As, I con as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus. In the King James, it's Son with a capital S came with the clouds of heaven, in other words, with the angels, and came to the Ancient of Days. He's coming to the throne room mm -hmm. judgment scene. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not pass be destroyed. And then he receives the vision. So here's this judgment scene. Now, what happened there? Now let's go back to <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9. So there were, he describes this tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, and he describes the first chamber, and then he describes the second chamber in verse 3, and he says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, mm -hmm which is the most holy, Hagia Hagion, is the original, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid around with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that had budded, and the table of the covenant. In other words, the Ten Commandments. And over it the cherubim of the glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, according to the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So that's what I explained, right? Yes. So he in type was the one who had internalized all the sins, typologically speaking, yeah. representing the great high priest Jesus Christ who was the real antitypical, the great fulfillment of all of these types oh, yeah. and shadows. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So the first tabernacle, the earthly one, mm -hmm. was just a type. Yes. This is something that took place in heaven. Now it amazes me that people say, that Adventism talks about the sanctuary in heaven as though it didn't exist. Yeah. It is. It's clear as crystal. Yes. <laughs> Even th th if you read and you understand what that Moses was shown the uh, the real one to make a duplicate of it. Exactly, and he, he was he given exact measurements. Yeah, he couldn't make something if he didn't see it from somewhere. 
and it is a shadow of the real thing. And then it says in verse 9, which was a figure for the time then mm. present. It was a shadow. It was a type. Yes. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. So this whole issue of perfection that is such a constant bone of contention with the Adventist uh, <laughs> critics. It is clear that the gifts and the sacrifices, all your works, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. There was a greater cleansing that was needed, mm. Christ himself, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. In other words, until the time of its fulfillment. But Christ, being come on high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, now listen to these words mm. carefully, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building. How much clearer can you get it? He says it twice. He says he's talking about this greater tabernacle, this heavenly one, and then it says not made with hands, in other words, heavenly mm -hmm. one, that is to say, a repetition, not of this building. So it's a heavenly one. And then this magnificent verse, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once mm. into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's the King James Version. Mm. Now, this is where there is a lot of criticism regarding this issue. Many believe that the disappointment in 1844 was as a result of a mistaken theology. Mm. But the prophecy of Daniel is very, very clear. It ends in 1844. Yes. What happened in 1844? The only clue we have is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Yes. Now, the sanctuary, which is now part of Advent doctrine, must explain to us what happened when the sanctuary was cleansed. Well, on the great day of atonement, there was a cleansing of the record of sin. It was a day when you afflicted your soul and you made every effort to be right with God. We are living in such a time. Yes. So in other words, after 1844, we are living in the anti-typical day of That's atonement. So now here's a question. And this is a very important question. Many believe that when Christ died, he went straight into the most holy place. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a problem because it is contrary to the whole sanctuary message. There was an earthly sanctuary and the priest officiated for a whole year in the first tabernacle. And then, on the Day of Atonement, he went into the second chamber, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, when did Christ officiate in the first tabernacle? If he is the high priest and he is the antitype of this whole process, then surely he also, if the type points to the antitype, had to do service in the holy, in the first chamber. When did he do it? Well, if he went into the most holy, then when did he go into the holy? Well, some believe that he must have done that before he came to earth, before he was incarnate. Well, there's a problem with that. Yes. Let's just read it. Verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own 
own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, if he only entered in with his own blood, if he only could do service in the heavenly with his own blood, his own blood was not available before he came to this earth. It was only shed for us at the cross. So, he could not have gone into the most holy. Now, why do the modern translations violate this principle? Because it says here in the King James that he went into the holy place. Yes. It doesn't say it went into the Hagia Hagion, most holy place. But the modern translations, even the new King James Version, change this to read most holy place. Yes. We can look it up, shall we look it up? Yes, why not? Let's put it on the screen. I just wanted to ask while you're looking it up. I've if I'm not mistaken, I've heard some people say, okay, when the veil was torn, that's the reason. So the most holy and holy actually became open to each other. The only reason why it tore was to show that the dispensation of the sanctuary, the earthly, had come to an end and that the wall of separation was now gone. Yes. It's but got nothing to do with the separation between the holy and the most holy in, a, in, in the heavenly sense. No, all. that had obviously two chambers because it was built on the pattern. Yes. So here we have the King James Version and it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. The NIV reads, he, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place. But it doesn't say Hagia Hagion. Yes. So it cannot be the most holy place once for all, by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. If we go to the New King James Version, it reads, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. Mm. So, logically, the King James is the only one here that renders us of these three correctly. So now, what is Jesus doing in the most holy place? <laughs> that is the next yes, crucial yeah. point. What is he doing in the most holy place? So, he went into the holy at his resurrection. And then, when did he go into the most holy? Yeah. The only clue we have is Daniel chapter 9, where we have the statement that the sanctuary shall be cleansed at the end of the 2300 day prophecy. What is he doing? Well, the law is there, right? Which is the standard of judgment. Yes. And we saw the great judgment scene taking place. In other words, Jesus went into the most holy. And there, the Adventists have coined a phrase which says, there the great pre-advent judgment takes place. And this, of course, creates a big can of worms because people will say that that is not biblical. That there is no pre-advent judgment because all will stand before the judgment scene of God, etc. So, this point is very important, this pre-advent judgment. Now, if I can put it simply, when Jesus returns, does he bring his reward with him? Yes. Yes. Is there a resurrection of the just? Yes. Is there a translation of the righteous? Yes. Is there a destruction of the wicked? Yes. Okay. So when Jesus returns, the righteous dead or raised, the righteous living or translated, they, together with them, go and meet the Lord in the air. The unrighteous are not resurrected. They are only resurrected a thousand years later. 
and the unrighteous living are destroyed, correct? Yes. So there must have been a judgment. Yes. It must have taken place in heaven, right? Yes. So before he was officiating, and it tells us in Daniel chapter 7 that books were opened. In other words, a record of deeds and acts was investigated and a judgment was made. The Bible is very clear. All judgment has been given to Christ. Yes. All judgment. So he's already performed the judgment before he comes. That is called a pre-advent judgment. Now what about the saints where the Bible says and judgment was handed over to, to them? them? Yes. Obviously, if the saints are in heaven and the others are not in heaven, judgment has already taken place. Yes. So what is handed over to him? This is what I like about God. Mm. He is so incredibly fair. The record that he based his judgment on is handed over to the saints because books are open. Yes. There's the book of life, there's the book of remembrance, all of these books. And the whole record is laid open to God's people and they can go through the judgment and actually verify that Christ's judgment was fair. Yes. Because in a sense Christ is also on trial mm. because the devil accuses him of not being fair. Now the saints can look and look at the book. So let's just talk about this, this judgment that is such a problem. I have a book here which is just a little summary of, of the issue. So this word investigation, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's not in the Bible. So people will say, but you know, that word is not in the Bible. Therefore, you cannot use it. Mm. But uh, the word millennium is not in the Bible, and we use it. And the word uh, incarnation is not in the Bible, and we use it. Or virgin birth, and we use it. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. And any judgment has three phases. There's the investigative stage, mm -hmm. where you investigate the issue. Then there is the pronouncement of judgment, and then there is the execution of yes. judgment, the executive phase. So those three phases you must have. So before Christ comes to the earth, there must be an investigation. Yes. And then there is a pronouncement of judgment. And then he says, let them that are wicked be wicked still, let mm -hmm. them that are just be just, just still, etc. Yes. No, there's a pronouncement. And then there is an executive judgment. Yes. He comes and he executes judgment. Now, let's be serious. We know there is a judgment. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 and 14, Hebrews 9 verse 27, tell us clearly that there is a judgment. And this judgment is of all men. Romans 14 verse 10 tells us this judgment is of all men. And there is a judgment of the righteous and the wicked. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 17. So there is a judgment. There will be an investigation of all the cases. And we read that in Daniel 7 chapter 10. Mm. And Luke chapter 20 verse 33 confirms it. So there is going to be a judgment. And then there's the pronouncement of the verdict, which you read in Revelation chapter 22, yes. verses 11 and 12. And then there is the execution of the judgment, which we read in Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. So all of those phases are there. Now, as we've already said, the righteous are declared worthy. Now this word is very interesting. We find it in Luke chapter 20, verse 35. And they're worthy to escape all of the condemnations. Luke 21 verse 36. And they're worthy of the kingdom of God. Now it's interesting, this little word, worthy, the Greek word that is used there doesn't denote that you are made worthy. It means that you are counted worthy. Okay. That's very important. Yes. And... Uh, it's Nothing also, you can do can get you the title of worthy. Correct. Now who's the judge? It's clear the Bible says that God is the judge 
and that all judgment has been given unto Jesus. Now we don't have to go into great detail, but there's one verse that's very fascinating. Let's just look it up, John 5 verse 24. And it reads as follows. Now, I'm going to read it first in the NIV for a particular reason. Everybody knows my stand on this issue, uh, which is so, quite disconcerting to some, but nevertheless. John 5 verse 24 in the NIV reads as follows. Very truly I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So you're not going to have judgment upon, um, pronounced upon this is a This is a problematic verse mm. because we've just seen that all will be judged. Yes. Everyone. Every single one. And there are numerous verses, and I mentioned them just now. So, you will not be judged. In other words, all you have to do is believe. Mm -hmm. And this is not biblical. Yes, you have to believe. But if you believe, and if you trust God, and if you love Him, then what? Keep His commandments. Then we'll keep His commandments. Now, you know what, this concept, that all you have to do is believe, mm. and then you are saved. Why is it not biblical? Why were Adam and Eve removed from the Garden of Eden? It's because, because of disobedience. Yes. Are you going to tell me that on the basis of believing alone, without obedience, you're going to go back into the, into into the Garden? Mm. If they were removed from the Garden of Eden because of disobedience, then surely the prerequisite for going back is obedience. There's the other problem. Because they disobeyed, they were subject to death. Now Christ paid that price for me. And he covers me with his righteousness. I have no righteousness of my own. But obedience remains as much a prerequisite. Like Revelation chapter 22 tells us that you have the right to the tree of life if you keep the commandments. Yes. Exactly. Now, let us just read this same verse in the revised version. And it says verily the same thing. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me has eternal life, and cometh not into judgment. So it's the same as the NIV. And believe and he won't be judged. But has passed out of death into life. Now, let's read the King James Version. And the King James says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Up to there we're the same, right? Mm -hmm. And shall not come into condemnation, mm -hmm. but is passed from death unto life. There's a little difference there. Yes. And the context is in harmony with uh, the rest of Scripture. So I come into judgment. But if I have the robe of Christ's spotless righteousness, then I do not come into yeah. condemnation. And that is a very, very important point. So this aspect of the pre-advent judgment, it's not a complicated issue. It is a very biblical issue. There is a judgment, and the judgment has already taken place. So there is a pre-advent judgment when Jesus comes. Now, if my record of sin was in the sanctuary, then that record is a record of confessed and forgiven sins mm -hmm. through the intercession of Jesus Christ. And therefore, I want my sins to be recorded in the sanctuary. Because if they're not recorded, yes. if I haven't confessed them over the Lamb, they're on my head. Yes. 
And the wages of sin is? Death. Death. So I have to believe in Jesus. I have to believe in his atonement. So it is not a false doctrine to believe in the sanctuary doctrine. It's a biblical doctrine. And Jesus went into the holy after his resurrection because that's when he had his own blood. And then sometime thereafter, and the only time we have in scripture is 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary, he went into the most holy where the pre-advent judgment takes place based on the law, mm -hmm. which is the standard of righteousness. It is beautifully logical. But I don't have to be afraid of it because Jesus is my, my righteousness. Now the other thing that the people say is that uh, Adventism preaches legalism. Mm. Now, <laughs> and they say you have to keep the Sabbath. Yeah. Now it always amazes me how keeping the Sabbath can be legal, legal. legalism because the Sabbath symbolizes rest. Yes. Rest from what? Rest from works. So therefore the Sabbath is the symbol of righteousness by faith and not the, the symbol of salvation by works. So people criticize Adventism on the basis of the sanctuary doctrine, which is biblical, as yes. we saw. It's a beautiful doctrine of the plan of salvation. They criticize them on the basis of the pre-Advent judgment, which says that the beautiful promise that if you are in Christ, you can, do not come into condemnation. But without obedience, nobody will see God. Yes. Because faith without works is dead. Mm. Now, these critics also take statements out of Alan G. White and say that they prove by this that Adventists believe in salvation by the law. And they believe that they can become sinless and perfect. Mm. And they quote quotes from Ellen G. White. And some of them might appear as if they are actually saying that. But now let, let's get real. Let's go to the Bible first. Let's talk about, the Bible says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a scary verse. Yes. It tells me that I must be as perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. Then you have the counter verse, which you find John in John, and he says, he who says he is without sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. Hmm. So now, two verses. One says I must be perfect, like my Father in heaven is perfect. The other one says, if I say that I am perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect, and I'm a liar. Mm. Uh, excuse me. How do we reconcile those two? I can do the same with Ellen G. White. Yes. I can take all the quotes where she talks about perfection and put them in a list and say, that's what Adventism teaches. Mm. But if I don't balance it with the statements which say that I cannot be sinless, then I have the same impasse as I have now here with the Bible. And it's very easy to do. Yes. Now, how do I reconcile two verses that are so diametrically opposed to each other? In Christ. Because I can be perfect, like my Father in heaven is perfect, if I am covered by the perfect robe of his righteousness. Yes. But that doesn't make me any less Sin. sinful yeah. in my nature. And that is how you reconcile it. And that is how you must read the spirit of prophecy. Now, this debate doesn't only rage within Adventism, it raged since the beginning of the world. There were those who said, I am saved by my works. Cain. Yes. And there were those that said, no, I'm saved by the sacrificial lamb that shed his blood for me. Abel. Mm. 
this dichotomy has been going on for a long, long time. If you go to Matthew 24, the greatest condemnation that Jesus ever expressed, woe to you, was against two groups, the scribes and the Pharisees. And there the same issue of salvation by works was a central part. It raged then and it rages today. today yeah. Don't say to the public, this is a war within Adventism, because it's not true. There is a war in Adventism, but it's not only in Adventism. The same war waged between Armenian thinking and Calvinistic thinking. It has come a long, long way. My wife put together a document where she took the statements from the Spirit of Prophecy to show what the real teaching is and that it is in perfect harmony with be ye perfect and he who says I am without sin. Perhaps we can look at a few of those quotes. You can. I think that would make the issue quite clear. Let's just go there. We're not going to discuss the whole document. Mm. Just a, a verse here and there, or a quote here and there. I'll make but it available. Please append it. Yeah. Make it an appendix so that people can study it for themselves and see what the issue is. Uh, let's look. Here's a quote from the Acts of the Apostles. True sanctification comes through the working out of the principles of love. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. 1 John 4 verse 16. The character will be purified, elevated, ennobled, and glorified. All the reformers taught that. This is not unique to Ellen G. White. Uh, Wesley taught this. Those who would gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. It is the fragrance of our love for our fellow men that reveals our love for God. It is a patience in service that brings rest to the soul. These are beautiful statements. Now, when we talk about perfection, she makes a very clear distinction between perfection and sinlessness. Mm. Remember, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he who says he's without sin is a liar. And it is so easy to quote one section without quoting yeah. the other one. She says, we must strive daily against outward evil and inward sin. If we would reach the perfection of Christian character, there is a war going on in our members. She says it is a constant warfare against the slavery of passion. She says we must be perfect Christians, deny ourselves all the way, Long tread the narrow thorny pathway that our Jesus trod. And then if we are final overcomers, heaven's sweet will be cheap enough. Here's the emphasis on the perfection. But she qualifies it. Yeah. None need fail of attaining in his sphere the perfection of Christian character. So she makes a distinction between in our sphere and in God's sphere. Mm. And God's sphere is as much higher than our sphere as God is higher than humanity. Yes. It's as simple as that. But I must make an effort. Yeah. If I have a mean disposition, I must ask God, cleanse me from this mean disposition. Paul says he crucifies the old man daily. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that old man is so stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> How do you achieve it? Through cooperation with divinity. Mm -hmm. That's how you achieve it.
He says in second selected messages, and while we cannot claim perfection of the flesh, mm. that's important. That's a real clear statement. We may have Christian perfection of the soul through the sacrifice made in our behalf. Sins may be perfectly forgiven. Isn't that magnificent? Yeah. So my perfection rests upon a perfect forgiveness, not upon my perfection. That is presumption. Our dependence is not in what man can do, it is in what God can do for man through Christ. Through faith in his blood all may be made perfect in Christ Jesus. Thank God that we are not dealing with impossibilities. We may claim sanctification, we may enjoy the favor of God. We are not to be anxious about what Christ in God thinks of us but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. Now, surely this takes away the fear of the pre-advent judgment. The pre-advent judgment is not as it is portrayed out there in the world. A guillotine that is just waiting to chop off your head. Ha ha, I caught you, it's in the book of record. No, it says, covered by my blood. And his imperfection is covered by my perfect righteousness. That is good news. Yes. In other words, you do not come into condemnation, but you surely come into judgment. judgment yes. Now, a judgment is actually good news. Absolutely. Absolutely. Christ, my intercessor, interceding on my behalf. Is that not good news? Of course. And that's the way you can get to heaven. Without that, there's no way. Now, now take an earthly tribunal. You sit in fear and trembling of the judge who's going to come out and condemn you. This judge has never made a mistake. Mm. And then the beautiful thing is he's also my advocate. He is my advocate. Where on earth can I have a judge who's also my advocate? And an advocate who has never lost the case. The judgment is good news, it's nothing to be afraid of. Thank God I have a judge, but mm -hmm. my sins have to precede me into the sanctuary. Yes. In other words, Peter said, when they said, what must we do to be saved? His first words were? Repent. Repent. Yes. What does it mean to repent? Acknowledge. Turn the around, answer. go the other way. So I've been on a path of perdition, turn around, go the other, go way. The other way, and go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. That is a true biblical doctrine. Here's another statement from the Acts of the Apostles. John did not teach that salvation was to be earned by obedience, but that obedience was the fruit of faith and love. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in the heart, our feelings, our thoughts, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God. The sanctified heart is in harmony with the perfect law of God. But then she qualified it, in my sphere, within my capability. Now when it comes to sinless, there's another story. So when it comes to perfection, she says, yes, we can be perfect. But she qualified it through the robe of Christ's righteousness, yes. right? Let's have a look at sinlessness. God could have proclaimed his truth through sinless angels. Angels are sinless. Heavenly angels, not yeah. fallen angels. Yes. <laughs> and Jesus, he, the sinless one, was treated as we deserve. That we, fallen and sinful, might be treated as he deserved. Jesus is sinless. He refers to him as the sinless one, the perfect one. He led a sinless life. Before the fall, Adam, were, Adam and Eve were sinless. That's the only time. Again from the, the book, The Acts of the Apostles. Let those who feel inclined to make a high profession of holiness 
Look into the mirror of God's law. As they see its far-reaching claims and understand its work as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, they will not boast of sinlessness. If we say, says John, not separating himself from his brethren, say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. She says, not a soul of you has holy flesh now. No human being on the earth has holy flesh. It is an impossibility. It's pretty clear. Yes. But she gets even stronger. How long will I have this nature? So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue. Besetting sins to overcome, so long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point where we can reach and say, I have fully attained. You know, we have people in the world that say that they are holy and sinless. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. She goes so far as to say, perfection exists only in our imagination. Can you see how you can quote the texts and distort her writings? People are always amazing me how they deal with these issues. <laughs> she wrote to one brother who claimed that he had now finally reached this sinless state. And uh, I must quote this one. It is a beautiful statement. She says, Some of them have even reached the almost hopeless position that they cannot sin. These, of course, have no further use of the Lord's Prayer, which teaches us to pray that our sins may be forgiven, and but very little use for the Bible, as they profess to be led by the Spirit. What a terrible deception. They think they are complete in Christ and know not that they are wretched, blind, miserable, poor and naked. That puts it beyond the shadow of doubt. Mm. I can use her writings to give such a distorted view that it would appear as if Adventism teaches Christian perfection through perfect obedience to the law. That's mm. legalism. Yes, and that's, a, that's the um, picture that the world has of Adventism. Absolutely. They think we say that you have to keep the law to be saved. Correct. And is, but in fact, that's totally misconception of what Adventism says. So let's, let's just repeat this again. Can I be saved by my obedience to the law? No. Can I be saved in my disobedience, my willful disobedience of the law? No. No. So there's a coin, <laughs> there's a one side of the coin and there's the other side oh, yes. of the coin. And that is why you have to reconcile Paul and James. Yes. And Martin Luther, when he discovered the great doctrine of justification by faith, he was so overwhelmed because remember, he came from Catholicism. I came from Catholicism too. And Martin Luther used to chastise himself. He used to whip himself. Mm. He used to whip himself repeatedly. And to this day, they whip themselves. Mm. Do you know that John Paul II regularly whipped himself? This is yeah. common knowledge. It's, it's a terrible thought. So this concept, I, I have to pay for my sins. This is where purgatory comes in. I pay for my sins. I am the one and not Jesus who paid for my sins. In other words, they deny the atonement. And here you have this, this concept in Martin Luther as a Catholic that he has to pay for his sins. And he discovers righteousness by faith. And it's like a weight falls off his shoulders. 
And I can understand that. Mm. He was so overwhelmed with the beauty of the gospel of salvation. It is the righteousness of Christ that saves me. And he called it an alien righteousness. He said, it's not a righteousness that I have of myself. It is an alien righteousness, one that comes from outside of me. It is the beautiful righteousness of, the, of Christ that covers me. And then he read in the book of James that faith without works is dead. Yes. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works, says James. And Martin Luther says, this book doesn't belong in the Bible. He called it an epistle of straw. Hmm. But he translated it. Yeah. But he didn't like it. It didn't fit into his newly discovered beautiful truth of righteousness by faith. And he actually said to his students, here is my doctor's hat. You remember in the old days they wore this little funny little doctor's hat? And he took the doctor's hat and he put it on the table. And he said, anybody who reconciles Paul and James can put that hat on his head. They'll get a doctorate, right? Yeah. And there it lay. Nobody took it. It lay there for I don't know how long. And one day, Martin Luther walked back into the class. He picked up his doctor's hat and he put it on his head. So what had he done? He reconciled it. He reconciled it. Yeah. He thought it through. The dichotomy, and the dichotomy is simple. I'm not saved by my works, but my works are a consequence of me being saved. Yes. Because I love God, I come back into harmony. Now, if Martin Luther reconciled it, then so must I, and so must you. Yes. And that is Adventism. So I think we only came through the sanctuary doctrine. It's biblical. Yes. Would you agree? Definitely. There is it's a sanctuary. There is a sanctuary in heaven. Absolutely. There is a first chamber and a second chamber. Christ could only enter in with his own blood. Yes. So when he had his own blood, which chamber did he go into? The holy. The holy. At some stage later, he must have gone into the most holy. Is there a judgment scene described in heaven where the judgment begins and the books are being opened? Yes. A pre-advent judgment, which takes place in heaven, because he came to the Ancient of Days, not to the earth. Yes. And then, what happens then, when that judgment is over? He comes back with his uh, execution. With his executive judgment. And then he hands it to the saints for verification, to show that he was fair. And is it good news or bad news, this judgment? It's good news. Why? Because it can set you free and you can go to heaven. Absolutely. And why can you be set free? What is the condition? What did Peter say? What was the condition? When they said, what must we do to be saved? What did he say? Repent. Ah. And? Be baptized. Be baptized for the washing away of your sins. sins. Yes. It? It's an amazing doctrine. And how many people accepted the invitation on that day? 3,000. 3,000. 3,000 accepted that invitation on that day. Yeah. Washing away your sins. What is a sin? Transgression of the law. Transgression of the law. The law is the standard. Who covers me for my unrighteousness? Jesus. Ah, it's such a beautiful, liberating doctrine. I wish everybody would embrace it. And God takes our weaknesses into account. Yes. He knows that within your sphere, this is the level of the bar that you can reach. Now the bar is so high that I can never reach it. Yes. But he can reach it. Now there's two things he could do. He could lower the bar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and say, okay, now you can jump over it. Did he do that? No. No, because he cannot lower the standard. So he couldn't take away the law at his crucifixion. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. No, the law stands. It's so high, I cannot reach it. But he can reach it. And he can pull me to that level by covering me with his righteousness. So 
all of these criticisms that we've spoken about, we only managed to get as far as the sanctuary. Yeah, but we'll get to the other ones. We'll get to the other ones as we go on. So, have you got a closing word for our listeners? Well, I'm encouraged to know that with Christ as my righteousness, I can actually have a chance at heaven. Absolutely. Amen. You do not come into condemn nation. nation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the news of the judgment, which is good news. Thank you, Lord, that we are not left to our own weaknesses and own devices, but that you cover us with your righteousness and that you have promised that if we forsake our sins and confess our sins, we do not come into condemnation, but through faith in the perfect offering of our Lord and Savior, we can stand before the God of heaven in absolute perfection. Not our perfection, but his perfection. Thank you for these promises in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.